Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel. Good to see you all here on this first Sunday in February. We're going to begin today with a reading from 2 Thessalonians 2.13. So if you would grab your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians 2.13 and Stan will read. Or I'll, well, we'll all read. <laughs> but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, word and work. Lord, what can we say? You've been so good to us. Your love is indescribable. We just can praise you throughout all eternity for your love, for your forgiveness and the peace that you've given us. And we praise you now. And we give you glory now. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
the shadows deepen we do but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do and do you wish that you could see it all
Lord Jesus, again, we're just so thankful to be gathered here today to be able to sing these praises to your name. And Lord, I'm just so thankful as uh, just thinking about Romans chapter 5 uh, this morning, Lord, where it says that yet when we're without strength, Christ died for the ungodly, and God commended his love towards us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord Jesus, I'm just so thankful this morning for the... Uh, the gift of Jesus Christ, the fact he was willing to humble himself to shed his blood on the cross for our sins and having our sins forgiven, raising in the third day, conquering sin and death and hell. And uh, this very week, Lord, as we continue to follow in the footsteps of Christ to the cross, Lord, as we're studying the book of Matthew, I just pray you'll continue to fill Pastor Dan with your spirit, Lord, as he shares with us from your word. Lord, just give him the word to say, may your word go forth in power and work in the hearts and lives of those that are here today. And we're also thankful as well, too, for our children, and Lord Jesus, just thankful for those that take the time each week to share with them, Lord, just from the littlest ones all the way to the middle school and high school. We just pray you'll fill them with your spirit this day as well, too, and again, just that this day will be a, a blessing and for your glory and I just thank you for this time. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I'd like to welcome you to Calvary Chapel, Olcott City this morning. I just want to share a few announcements with you. Do we have any youth out there that are awake this morning? Oh. Should I, should I rewind and try that again? Are our youth here this morning? Okay, that's better. All right, just a reminder, Youth Fellowship Night is coming up uh, on February the 19th. Don't forget about that. Uh, it's going to be from 5.30 to 8.30. I know it sounds like it's really far away, but really it's not. It's just about a week or two, two weeks away. So uh, make sure, too, with that, we want to make that opportunity for you to invite your, your friends as well as uh, family members there. And just maybe those even at school who don't know Jesus as their Savior, it's a good opportunity to share and, and uh, be a witness to the community and have a good time and fun and fellowship together. Also, I'm looking for Jody. Where did Jody go? Oh, she's right behind me here. Jody has a special announcement as well. I'm here. Um, this Friday night, we're having a Galentine's night for all the girls, middle school, high school, and of course all of our female workers. Um, we'd love to have you guys out to celebrate Galentine's, uh, to celebrate um, just a nice time with fellowshipping with other um, girls together. Um, we're going to have fun. Please sign up online. You should have gotten an email on that or see me. We just need to know for food purposes so we don't have like too little or too much. Um, so yeah, this week, this Friday from 6 to 8.30. Yeah, 6 to 9.30? 6 to something. Look it up. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Hopefully we'll see you this Friday. Just if you're dropping your girls off, please come pick them up sometime before Sunday. <laughs> Also, uh, for the men, we had a great men's breakfast yesterday. It's a great time in fellowship around the word yesterday. And I uh, just want to encourage the men as well, too. The ladies had their turn with their retreat uh, just a couple weeks back, and I'd like to encourage the men to sign up as well, too. Uh, it's right around the corner, March 2nd to the 4th. So we do have a limited number of slots that are available. So I'd like to encourage you to sign up for that. And again, it'll just be a great time uh, away together uh, in the word is also, and also just to be able to be in fellowship with one another. And we'd like to give you a few moments to greet one another, and the kids are dismissed for the Calvary Kids Ministry.
Okay, if you guys can make your way back to your seats for me, please. Well, good morning to all of you. It's great to see you today. Great to be in the house of the Lord with you all, worshiping the Lord. You guys doing okay today? Yes. Great. So Sunday mornings, as you know, we go verse by verse through the New Testament. Uh, we're currently in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 27 this morning, if you want to turn there in your Bible. If you don't happen to have a Bible with you, just raise your hand and somebody will put a Bible in your hand. Uh, and just keep your hand up so they can see it. But we're in Matthew chapter 27 this morning. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, Matthew 27 this morning, and please stand with me as I read the word for us this morning, beginning in verse 11, it's where we left off last time. Matthew 27, verse 11, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said to him, let him be crucified. And then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for... Um, what you endured for us through your your death, through the crucifixion, the suffering that you endured for our sins. We thank you for that, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your word this morning. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be upon me to teach your word this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated. So we have we have slowed down our study through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we've slowed down the pace because of the importance of these uh, verses that we've come to in this section of the Gospel of Matthew, where now we're, we're looking at the trials of Jesus leading up to his crucifixion. Uh, and, and as you recall, if you've been with us the last few weeks, Jesus has endured one long night where he was arrested in Gethsemane uh, and then he was put through a series of trials before the religious leaders of Judaism and they condemned him to die for blasphemy 
Uh, Jesus was guilty of being the Christ and the Son of God. Uh, that's why they condemned him. The religious leaders uh, beat and mocked Jesus. And then early in the morning, the entire uh, Sanhedrin, which were the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin led Jesus to Pontius Pilate. All of them went. They led Jesus to the Roman governor and they take Jesus to Pontius Pilate because the Jewish Sanhedrin no longer had the authority to execute people. The Roman government revoked the power of capital punishment from the Jewish leaders. And so they had to bring Jesus to the Romans and they had to persuade the Roman governor Pontius Pilate to put Jesus to death for them. And, and so now this begins the civil trials of Jesus. Jesus was put through three religious trials that we've already looked at, and he will be put through three civil trials before the Roman authorities before he is crucified. And this is the first of the civil trials before the Roman authorities. Now, remember, Jesus told his disciples that this is the way it would go. Back in Matthew chapter 20, if you recall, Jesus said to his disciples, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. So this is all going according to God's plan, precisely. We see here in our passage today, now Jesus is brought before the Roman governor who was named Pontius Pilate. Now, uh, just for some background information here, the Roman government had their headquarters in a place called Caesarea Maritima or Caesarea by the sea. It was right on the Mediterranean coast. But during the Jewish feast, this is Passover, during the Jewish feast, the governor Pontius Pilate would stay in Jerusalem uh, in case there were any kind of issues that came up with the Jewish people so that he was there. They had a large uh, number of soldiers that they would bring into the city to control everything. And so for that reason, Pontius Pilate is in the city of Jerusalem during the Passover, and he is staying in a palace that was originally built by Herod the Great. Uh, and I have a picture for you of what the palace probably looked like. Uh, this is a little model my boys and I built yesterday. Uh, what'd you do on Saturday? Watch games? No, but you can see the, the two rectangular buildings kind of at the forefront of the screen. And if you look all the way up at the top, you can see the steps leading up into the temple uh, where the temple stood. And so this this palace in the forefront, the two buildings in the forefront with the courtyard in between, this is a palace that was built by Herod the Great. And this is where Pontius Pilate is staying in one of those two rectangular buildings. Um, this is also, by the way, just a little extra information for you. Uh, this is the same palace that the wise men came to coming to seek the one born, the king of the Jews, when Jesus was born. Uh, and, and now, ironically, at the end of his life, Jesus is on trial in that same location for being the king of the Jews. Uh, and you notice also that courtyard there, and there's, uh, there's the mosaic tile that's depicted there. J for just so you know, uh, like last year, up until last year, that area in Jerusalem was just a vacant lot. Uh, and last year, or 2020, 2021, uh, a developer built a parking lot there. And when they excavated it to build the parking lot, they uncovered part of the mosaic floor of the palace and then paved over it. So it was... You know, there's some photos of it that exist. There's a video of it that exists. Uh, but otherwise, it's it's buried now under a parking lot. So um, there you go. So Pontius Pilate, 
Pontius Pilate served as the Roman governor over Judea and Samaria from 26 AD to 36 AD, so only about 10 years. Uh, and as governor, Pilate's primary job was to maintain peace in the territory he governed and to collect taxes for Caesar. History tells us that Pontius Pilate was a very ruthless, cruel ruler over Judea and Samaria. Philo, who was a Jewish philosopher that lived at the same time as Jesus Christ, said Pontius Pilate's rule was characterized by, quote, briberies, insults, robberies, outrages, wanton injuries, executions without trial, and endless and grievous cruelty. For example, when Pilate was first appointed as governor of Judea, he brought uh, incense or signs into Jerusalem that depicted the image of Caesar on them, and the Jewish people were offended that Pilate would bring these images into the holy city of Jerusalem because in the Jewish mind, those images were idolatrous. And a large crowd of Jews showed up in Caesarea Maritima at the headquarters of the governor to protest the fact that he brought these signs, these images of Caesar into the city of Jerusalem. And Pilate responded to their protests by sending his military out to slaughter them which outraged the Jews even more, so even more protesters came, and he sent the military to slaughter them. So this is the kind of guy that Pilate was. On another occasion, Pilate brazenly confiscated money from the temple in Jerusalem to pay for an aqueduct system for the city. And so he wanted to build a water system for the city of Jerusalem. He thought the Jews should pay for it since it's their city. And so he went to the temple, he took money out of the treasury the people had given to God to pay for and fund the aqueduct system. Understandably, the Jewish people were outraged by this act, and Pilate knew they would be outraged, he knew they would protest, and so Pilate, in anticipation of their protest, he had many of his soldiers disguise themselves as Jews and blend in with the crowd, and when the Jewish people began to protest, Pilate signaled his soldiers and his soldiers pulled out clubs and daggers and massacred the Jewish people in the streets. This is the kind of ruler he is. Uh, if, you're, if you're taking notes, you can jot down Luke chapter 13, verse 1. Luke 13, 1. There, Jesus is asked about an incident that had happened recently where Pilate murdered some people from Galilee while they were making a sacrifice in the temple. And we don't know any of the details of that story other than what is stated in that verse, but apparently Pilate went in and massacred worshipers in the temple courts while they were making an offering, making a sacrifice to the Lord in the temple. And that's, that's just a few examples from Pilate. Pilate ruled over Judea and Samaria with an iron fist. He had no regard for the Jewish people or their religious practices, no regard for their lives. He was a he was a brutal governor. But it, when it comes to the trial of Jesus, Pilate seems to behave out of character. He doesn't act like himself. He doesn't act like the brutal brutal ruler he's known to be. Uh, he acts weak. He acts indecisive regarding Jesus and in his response to the religious leaders. In fact, if you're taking notes in John's account, John 19, 8 tells us that during this, this trial, Pilate was afraid. That's what it says. Pilate was afraid and Pilate tried to release Jesus multiple times. And so, so Jesus affected Pilate greatly. Now, as, as we dig into this first phase of the civil trial of Jesus, it's, it's helpful to consider the other gospel accounts 
uh, you know, you, you may want to just uh, uh, find Luke 23 in your Bible. We're not necessarily going to turn there. I'm going to reference it. Also, John's Gospel, John 18. Uh, and, and when you look at the different Gospels together, you get kind of a more complete picture of the trial. John's Gospel in John 18 tells us that when the religious leaders brought Jesus to Pontius Pilate, the religious leaders did not enter Pilate's palace that we had the picture up here. They did not enter his palace because they did not want to defile themselves. Because it's Passover. Which just shows how twisted the human heart can be. The religious leaders were concerned about defiling themselves, becoming ceremonially unclean while they're attempting to kill the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. In their minds, killing Jesus is perfectly fine and acceptable. There's nothing wrong with that at all, just as long as you don't do anything that might defile you in the process of killing him so you can still celebrate the Passover. That's pretty warped thinking, isn't it? Do you know, have you been alive for five minutes? Do you know that people can have some pretty warped ways of thinking? And people can justify just about any behavior in their mind and any action. You know, the prophet Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And, and look at verse 11 again. It says here, so Jesus is brought to Pilate. Pilate comes out of his palace uh, because they, the ro re religious leaders won't go in. And it says that Jesus stood before the governor. The governor sat in his judgment seat in judgment of Jesus Christ. And the governor will question Jesus and then give his verdict on Jesus. You know, people may pass judgment on Jesus in this life. People may judge whether they think he's true or not or should be believed or not. But the Bible tells us each person will stand before Jesus Christ one day and Jesus will be the final judge of mankind. And every person, every one of us in this room will have to give an account of himself or herself to Jesus. And the Bible says that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess him as Lord. Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate now, but Pilate will stand before Jesus Christ. And Jesus will have the final word, as he will with everyone. That's why we need to put our faith in Christ for salvation. So now Luke's account at this point, Luke's, Luke tells us the religious leaders made three charges against Jesus and Luke chapter 23, verse 2, I'll read it to you. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So the official charges against Jesus are he is accused of perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and claiming to be Christ, a king. The religious leaders cannot bring him before Pilate and say that he's guilty of blasphemy. Pilate doesn't care about that. That's a religious issue. When they bring Jesus before Pilate, they, they need to bring charges that will concern Pilate and concern Rome. And so they accuse Jesus of perverting the nation or plotting against the nation, plotting against the Roman government, trying to subvert Roman authority in Israel. They come and they basically say he, he's a revolutionary. He's trying to incite a rebellion against against Rome. He's trying to lead the people in a rebellion. He, he's 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 telling, you know, he's, he's a dangerous revolutionary. And remember, Pilate's number one job as a governor is to keep peace. They also accuse Jesus of telling people to not pay taxes to Caesar. Now, is that what Jesus said? No. What did Jesus say? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. The opposite is true. But they accuse him of 
telling people not to pay their taxes. The third accusation is he claims to be Christ, a king. So he is a direct threat to Caesar. Pilate interrogates Jesus regarding these charges. Verse 11 says, now, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, saying, are, are you the king of the Jews? That's the accusation. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. No, notice that Pilate doesn't ask, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? He's not concerned about that. He says, are you the king of the Jews? A king is a threat to Caesar's authority. Now, F.F. F. Bruce, who was a Greek scholar, points out that in the Greek, the emphasis of Pilate's question is on the word you. So Pilate's question is more like, are you the king of the Jews? You? You are the king of the Jews? Maybe Pilate asked this question in disbelief. Maybe he asked this question, you know, kind of shocked. After all, Jesus was a simple carpenter from Galilee. He doesn't look like a king. He's not dressed like a king. He's not dressed like royalty and royal, royal garments and fancy clothing. Plus, remember, the religious leaders beat up Jesus, pummeled him earlier in the previous night, so his face is bloodied and bruised and swollen. And Jesus doesn't look like a king to Pilate. He doesn't look like a dangerous revolutionary. He doesn't look like someone who's subverting the Roman authority over Israel. And so Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? You're the threat? You? You're what the fuss is all about? You're the reason the religious leaders showed up here at my palace so early in the morning? And in response, Jesus affirms that he is the king of the Jews. Look what it says. He says to Pilate, it is as you say and that's all he says he doesn't he doesn't work a miracle he doesn't explain anything just yes i am now again luke's gospel at this point luke's gospel tells us that at this point Pilate takes jesus back out to the religious leader and Pilate declares i find no fault in this man i find no fault in this man Pilate declares he's he's innocent He's not a threat to Caesar. He's not, he's not a revolutionary. And so Pilate's initial ruling was that Jesus is innocent. But then look at verse 12. The religious leaders made many more accusations against Jesus in verse 12. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. And then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he answered him not one word so that the governor marveled greatly. Pilate was used to defendants defending themselves against accusations. But Jesus was silent. It says he answered not one word. And so the, go the governor marveled greatly because Jesus offered no defense. Now, Jesus was silent in fulfillment of of the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, that says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. And so he opened not his mouth. You know, Jesus was silent before his accusers because Jesus was dying in our place. For our sins as our substitute. And we are guilty before God. There's no defense or excuse Jesus could offer for us. And so he's silent. And Luke's account again tells us that as the chief priests and elders are shouting these different accusations about Jesus, one of them mentions that Jesus is from Galilee. And Pilate hears that. And so, again, Luke's gospel tells us that when Pilate heard that Jesus was from Galilee, Pilate saw a way out of this situation. He saw a way of escape for himself. Galilee was not Pilate's jurisdiction. He's over Judea and Samaria. Herod Antipas ruled over Galilee. And Herod Antipas 
happened to be in Jerusalem. In fact, you can bring that picture back up for us, please. You see how there's two buildings, right? Herod Antipas is staying in the other palace. And so Pilate sees a way out of this situation. Did you say Galilee? Well, hey, that's not my jurisdiction. You know how bureaucrats can be. I'm sorry, that's not our department. You're going to have to take that down to zoning. You go down to zoning. No, I, that's not us. You need to go to fire. And Oh, oh no, we don't, we don't deal with it. You need to go, right? And so here, Pilate, Pilate says, hey, I, I'm, I'm Judea Samaria. I'm not Galilee. Herod Antipas, that's Galilee. And so he sends him probably just across the courtyard to the other building over to Herod Antipas. He goes to Herod Antipas, and that's the second phase of the civil trial before Herod Antipas. Again, that's in the other Gospels. Matthew doesn't record that. But he goes before Herod Antipas, and Jesus refused to answer Herod's questions. He was silent before Herod Antipas. And so Herod Antipas sent Jesus back to Pontius Pilate. And once Jesus returned to Pilate, Pilate declares to the religious leaders, this is in Luke chapter 23, verses 14 and 15. Listen to what he says. Luke 23, verses 14 and 15. You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. That's the official ruling. I have examined him. Herod has examined him. And we have found nothing. This man is innocent. And for the second time, Pontius Pilate declares Jesus innocent. And he says, Herod also found no fault in him. Herod also found him innocent. He's done nothing deserving of death. You don't have a case here. He poses no threat to Rome. He's no threat to Caesar. Right. And in a normal court case, what does the judge do? Case dismissed. But watch what happens. Verse 15. Now at the feast. The governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And so now Pilate will attempt to release Jesus. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. He knows, Pilate knows, that their motives are not pure. He knows that they're doing all of this because they're envious of Jesus, because the crowds are, are, are flocking to Jesus and believing Jesus. The common people received him gladly. Pilate knows that. He knows this whole thing is a sham. He knows that Jesus has done nothing wrong. He knows that Jesus is innocent. But Pilate doesn't do the right thing here. And so the Romans, they had this custom that during the Passover, they would release one Jewish prisoner as kind of a goodwill gesture to the Jewish people. And he gives the Jewish people that are gathered there that morning outside of his palace, he gives them a choice. He can release Jesus or he can release Barabbas. And we, we are told Barabbas was a notorious prisoner. The other Gospels tell us Barabbas was an insurrectionist who led a revolt in the city of Jerusalem, and he was a murderer. And so what Pilate does here is he intentionally gives the people a very lopsided choice between Jesus and Barabbas. You can have released into your community Jesus 
or you can have Barabbas released into your community. Do you want Jesus, who does good everywhere he goes, who heals people, who works miracles, who raises the dead back to life, walking your streets? Or do you want a notorious prisoner and murderer walking your streets? Do you want the one who gives life to people? Or do you want the one who takes life from people? It never entered Pilate's mind that they would ask for Barabbas over Jesus. That they would say, give us the murderer instead of Jesus. That they would say, we would rather have someone who is dangerous for society than Jesus. This reminds me of the story of the demon possessed man and Gadara. Remember, Jesus cast the demons out of the demon possessed man and he cast the demons into the swine, the pigs. Right. It's the first case of deviled ham. That's where it comes from. Right. <laughs> and then they then they run down the slope and they plunge into the Sea of Galilee and drown. They do a swine dive. Right. These are great, great classic pastor jokes here for you. Right. And remember the description of the demon possessed man. They, the, the people in that surrounding community, they had tried to incarcerate him. They tried to chain him. He broke the chains. Uh, and finally, it, we're told the people just avoided that area where this guy lived. Just nobody goes over there anymore because there's this crazy demon possessed, violent man over there. Jesus delivers this guy from demon possession. And it says that the man after Jesus delivered him, he, he was naked before and would cut himself. And it says after Jesus delivered him that he was uh, clothed and seated and in his right mind. That's what Jesus does in a person's life. He, he, he puts you in your right mind. And, and, and then it were told that the people from the area, from the city that was there, uh, they came out. And instead of thanking Jesus for delivering the demon possessed man who had terrorized their community, they asked Jesus to leave. The people of that community would rather have pigs than Jesus. And here, given the choice between a murderer walking their streets or Jesus walking their streets, they'd rather have the murderer. We'll take anything instead of Jesus. Give us anything but Jesus. And please listen, give me your attention. Don't think people are any different today. People today, society today, the culture today says, we'll allow anything but Jesus. You look at what they're teaching in our schools or what they're allowing in public libraries now. But you can't bring Jesus into the school. You can't bring the Bible into the school. You can have a drag queen story hour at the public library. But you try to have a Christian story hour, you're going to need an attorney for that. Don't give us Jesus. We'll take anything but Jesus. You know, Jesus said that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. That's the issue. That's the issue here in our text. That's the issue in the world today. That's the issue in our culture. Men love darkness rather than light because the light exposes their deeds. Men, mankind chooses darkness over light. And man attempts to extinguish the light of Jesus Christ. And you see that here. We'll, we'll, we'll take the murderer. Instead of Jesus, look at verse 19. So while Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat. And he's got this crowd here that's getting worked up. His wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with this just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. The wife of Pilate has a, a disturbing dream about Jesus and she's awakened by this dream. And she immediately sends a message to her husband warning him to have nothing to do with this just man or this innocent man. 
you know, God, God uses dreams. We see dreams play a very prominent role in the New Testament, especially here in the Gospel of Matthew. Here we even see that God communicates to a non-believer through a dream. And imagine how this impacted Pilate to receive a message from his wife, warning him about Jesus, declaring his innocence while he's sitting in the judgment seat to judge Jesus. And he's got this multitude that are getting worked up. Did this cause Pilate to pause at all? So Pilate knows Jesus is innocent. He's already declared that he's innocent. Herod Antipas found no fault in Jesus. Now Pilate receives this sobering warning from his wife. Declaring that Jesus is innocent and that he should have nothing to do with this just man. Please listen, give me your attention. Pilate knows the right thing to do is dismiss this case against Jesus. And to set Jesus free. But Pilate is not courageous enough to do the right thing. His decision is influenced by the mob. His decision is influenced by what others think. Listen to me, please. The best time to do the right thing is the moment you know the right thing to do. Doing the right thing is not something you should ever put off until later. Don't delay doing what you know is right. The longer you delay doing the right thing, the harder it will be to do the right thing thing. And probably all of us have been in a situation at some point in life when we knew the right thing to do or we knew that we should say no or we knew that we should just shut this thing down. And instead of doing the right thing, when we knew what it was, we, we put it off and we put it off and put it off, maybe because of peer pressure, maybe because we feared the repercussions, maybe we feared hurting someone's feelings. And then later on, we regret it not taking action sooner. We regret it putting it off. We, we said, I, I should have done this a long time ago. I should have done this six months ago. I should have dealt with this at the very beginning when I knew it was wrong before I got this deep into it. Now I'm up to my neck in this thing and I'm entangled in it. And it's really, really difficult to get myself untangled from it. As soon as Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, he should have dismissed the case. But he didn't. So look at verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. You know, there's there's people that have traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover from from all over the, the region, all over Israel, all over the Mediterranean world. You know, and you've got these chief priests, the leaders of Judaism there in the crowd and the, the chief priests are saying, release Barabbas, release Barabbas. And so you've got people probably in the crowd or they're not exactly sure what's going on. Who, who's Barabbas? Who's Jesus? And but the priests seem to know. And so they just follow the leading of the priests here. And the priests and the elders persuade the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Verse 21, the governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And that's a question every person must answer. What will you do with Jesus? And what you do with Jesus, how you answer that question will determine where you spend eternity. You know, first John chapter five, verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. That's pretty clear. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. If you haven't, well, then you do not have eternal life. What will you do with Jesus? What do you want me to do with Jesus, who is called Christ. And notice, they all said to him, let him be 
crucified. There's not one sympathizer with Jesus in the crowd. They all, with one voice, want Jesus to be crucified. And they want Barabbas released. You know, the name Barabbas, it means the son of the father. The son of the father. And the crowd wants a false son of the father. Instead of the true son of the father. Give us the false murderous son of the father. Instead of the true son of the father. You know, this is a foreshadowing in a sense of of the world's embrace of the Antichrist that will take place during the tribulation period. The world will receive a false Christ instead of the true Christ. And the world will put its hope in a false Christ and a false savior and reject the true savior. So that brings us to verse 23. The crowd says, let him be crucified. And the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, all the louder, saying, let him be crucified. The crowd doesn't answer Pilate's question. Pilate asks, what evil has he done? And they don't answer that question because they can't answer that question because Jesus has done no evil. He was without sin. He lived a perfect life. And since the crowd can't answer the question, what evil has he done? What do they do? They just shout even louder. Let him be crucified. People haven't changed, have they? You know, you, you, you can ask a, a reasonable question if they can't answer. They'll just shout louder. Just shout you down. Yeah, but can you answer my question? No. You're so, ah, ah. Isn't that the culture we live in today? So when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult, a a riot was rising here, the, the crowd's getting out of control. He took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. You know, you cannot wash your hands of Jesus. You can't just wash your hands and say, well, I don't know about Jesus. I'm not sure. If he really is the way of salvation, I I guess I'll just kind of wait and see. You have to make a decision. You can't be neutral. You can't remain undecided on Jesus. You know, Jesus said you are either for me or against me. There's there's no there's no third category. You're either for me or against me. Uh, you're, 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 you can't be neutral with Jesus. You are either living for him or you're living against him. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, Pastor. I'm not against Jesus. Well, are you living for Jesus? Well, no. Well, then you're against him. That's what Jesus said. If you're not living for him, you're living against him. Pilate tries to just wash his hands of the whole situation, but you, you can't wash your hands of Jesus. Verse 25, and all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. We'll take the blame for his death. Let his blood be upon us. That's how badly they want Jesus destroyed. And of course, I don't think they fully understood what they were saying. You know, it's funny if you're taking notes in Acts chapter five, the same religious leaders will accuse the apostles of trying to blame them for the death of Jesus, and they will say, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Wasn't that what you said? You said, let his blood be upon us. And now they said, well, don't try to put his blood upon us. So then he released Barabbas to them. If anyone knew what it means to have Jesus die in your place, it's Barabbas. Barabbas was guilty. Barabbas deserved to die on a cross, but he was set free and an innocent man died on the cross in his place. And the only reason Barabbas was released is because Jesus was condemned in his place. And listen, that's the gospel message. 
That is the illustration of the gospel. We were guilty in our sin. We deserve God's judgment. We deserve God's wrath. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But Jesus died in our place on the cross as our substitute. He was punished in our place for our sins so that now we are released from God's judgment. We are released from God's wrath, just like Barabbas. We've been set free. We've been set free from God's judgment. And we've been set free not because of anything we've done, but because in our place condemned, he stood. And so if you're wondering, well, where, where do we fit into this story? Where do I fit in this story? How does this story apply to me? We're Barabbas in the story. Guilty, condemned, deserving of judgment, deserving of death. And Jesus died in our place so that we could be set free. And now the Bible says we're justified. It's just as if we've never sinned at all. For Barabbas, he's totally free. And how is he totally free? Because Jesus died in his place and took his place on the cross. So again, verse 26, then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Jesus was scourged. Now, Matthew doesn't describe the scourging to us or the crucifixion to us because his original readers were familiar with both. They, did, they didn't need a description. Uh, the, the Romans, they would use a, a whip that had several leather straps attached to a wooden handle and tied into the leather straps were pieces of glass and sharp metal and lead weights. Think of like a fishing weight. And, and the whip used in a scourging was designed to tear the flesh off of the body. And someone, uh, you know, sometimes so much flesh was ripped off by the scourging uh, that, that bones and organs would be exposed. It would rip the flesh down all the way to the bone. And the Romans would scourge a person's entire body, not only the back, but the legs and the front even the face. And the Romans did not place a limit on the number of lashes a person received. The Jews had a limit, 40 lashes. But the Romans had no such limit to the number of lashes. And they would take a victim and they would tie the person's hands to a post, have them, you know, bent over or on their knees with their back, you know, stretched and exposed. And there would be a Roman soldier on each each side of that person. And they would just wail away on this person with this whip, with all of the sharp metal and glass and weights in it and just wail away on that prisoner. And sometimes prisoners died because of the blood loss during the scourging and never even made it to the cross. And the whole purpose of this scourging that these Romans would inflict on their victims, it was to get the person to confess to their crime. Jesus is innocent. He's committed no sin. He's committed no crime. And they would wail away on this person to get them to confess to their crime or to name their accomplices in their crime. And Jesus was silent through the scourging. Now, if you're a Roman soldier and this is your job, and your job is to get that guy to confess and he's not saying a word, what are you going to do? Well, you're just going to even go at it harder, right? And just keep going and going and turn him over. Let me do the front of him. We're going to get this guy to name some names. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't name any names? He died for you. He died for me. Aren't you glad he didn't name your name? I'm glad he didn't name my name. This scourging, it was a fulfillment of scripture. 
Psalm 129 verse 3 says, listen to this. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. What a graphic description of the whip plowing on his back. Isaiah 50 verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 53 But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus endured the scourging and the cross. Because he loves us. He took our punishment. He took the punishment for our transgressions, for our iniquities. For our sins. He was he was chastened in our place for our peace so that we can have our sins forgiven and so that we can have peace with God. And second Corinthians chapter five, verse 19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Instead of imputing our trespasses to us, he imputed our trespasses to Christ. And then he punished Christ in our place so that we could be reconciled to God. And after this scourging, Pilate, bring Jesus out one last time before the crowd and say behold the man and the crowd will say crucify him it wasn't enough it wasn't en- enough for the crowd they wanted him destroyed and so after Jesus was scourged Pilate delivered him to be crucified. And Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Jesus, for enduring the scourging, the beating for us. We thank you, Jesus, that while you were taking our punishment for us in our place, you you remained silent. We thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to endure the scourging and endure the cross. Lord, your word tells us for the joy that was set before you. The joy of forgiving our sins and being and reconciling us to the father. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that. By your stripes, we're healed of our sin, we're healed of death. We're grateful, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to close with our benediction. Let's sing. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me and melt me, mold me, fill me, and use me. If you're here today, you need prayer for anything at all. There'll be men and women down front available to pray with you as we close out the service. If you're here, you've never trusted Jesus Christ for salvation. He died for you. He died for you to take your sins and to pay the the penalty that you owe to pay your debt. 
and you have to receive him as your Lord and Savior. So if you've never done that before, as we close out the service, I want to invite you to come down front, talk with somebody, receive prayer before you go. Uh, if you're here and you have drifted away from the Lord and you need to rededicate your life to Christ, do that before you go. Again, just come down front and receive prayer. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace this week in Jesus' name. Amen.